I am Angeles Briones. I'm a PhD in design from Politecnico di Milano, and I'm actually doing my postdoc at the Density Design Research Lab at the Design Department of Politecnico. And tonight, I'm very glad to welcome my two guests, my very special guests coming from Chile. Actually, um, one of them is in Chile, and uh, the second guest is actually in the Netherlands. So he's actually spending his time with me tonight at midnight. Uh, so welcome to Carlos and Car Carlos Esfe and Camila Rios. Hi, Camila. Carlos. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you both together. <laughs> you too, dear Angeles. So first of Hello. all, I must say that I already drank my glass of wine, so sorry for that. <laughs> I'm here with my spirit, even when it's late. <laughs> no, so, well, for making the welcome, um, for introducing you, both of you, I will first like to ask you to present yourself. So, where are you right now? What are you doing? And so on. Um, hi. I am Camila Rios, I'm a designer, and recently I finished a master's degree in material and visual culture at UCL. Um, I'm a lecturer uh, at the School of Design at Universidad Católica de Chile. And lately my research has been focused on the Chilean textile industry, clothing in context of protest, and the study in general of materials. Great. And you, Carlos? Hi, everybody. I'm Carlos Feyer from Chile. Um, my background is in architecture. I also work as an architect for a long time. And then I decided to move towards design and the art practice. So I just finished last week, actually, uh, my master's degree in the Design Academy I know in, where I was dipping more into design. But let's say that it's fully art, what we were doing there. Uh, actually, I have a lot of questions about your project and the uh, different <laughs> borders between design, art, and so on. But uh, well, so first of all, I would really like to to say a couple of words why we are the three of us together in this room. And uh, just to tell the story, I met Camila uh, and Carlos when I believe that around 2013. We were working together with Camila at the communication, um, let's say, the communications of the design school of Universidad Católica. And we worked together very close. And I remember many times uh, where Camila and Carlos were already having this small uh, startup, let's say. <laughs> you, were, you were already designing a very special very special type of uh, design project where from a two-dimension plain material you perform different design projects making them on 3d i remember very clearly the um, the um, the small uh, bags where you can put your coins and your money and so on and i remember we spent a lot of different evenings like just chatting like commenting your projects and for me it was really new since my background is more into communications but between you and camila there was this type of um kind of a really close relationship among materials about shapes about volumes and i really enjoyed those very special evenings at the office <laughs> yeah, i remember that too <laughs> <laughs> so well um, for this talk we we define we prepare a statement in which when actually thank you very much to the design department for inviting us for this conversation and we were asked to define a sort of a statement about how we as millennials actually when i discovered that i was a millennial i felt very very young <laughs> but uh, how we as young designers are are defining our design practices and with camila and carlos we we define this this statement about we as young designers we are seeking new design practices that question the foundations on which ideas of the world and society have 
have been built. So we can rethink the opposites and dualism, not as a contradiction, but as a positive tension capable of sublimating the confrontation of two realities. And design has the capacity to narrate the relationships we have and can have with our experiences of the worlds. So from this statement, I, I want to, to open the conversation, uh, bringing um, a quote from Arturo Escobar, which is an author that I discovered during my, my PhD research. Um, and our statement, I believe it re really resonates a lot with the autonomous design that Escobar defined as an, as an ontological approach to design that provides paths toward imagining design practices that contribute to people's defense on the territories and cultures. And I wanted to bring this quote since all, all three of, of us find words, find this as, uh, we find words that are constantly coming back to our work as designers, which are conflict, tension between opposites, uncertainty, contradictions, and the need from design to bring new alternative narratives to society that invite us to reflect on our relationships with the world. So um, in this first part of the conversation, I, I um, and previously talking with Camila and Carlos, I realized that somehow we recognize uh, a way of getting in touch with our situated conditions between tension and uncertainty. So that's why I wanted to, to start uh, this chat asking Camila about uh, how do you see the uncertainty and how do you reflect about it in our design practices? Mm. Thanks, uh, Angeles. Yes, I think that we are clearly in a time of collapse and crisis. So globally, we are in an environmental crisis and in a health crisis. And in my country and in our country, we are in a political, economic uh, crisis, which has led us to experience long protests to achieve different improvements in the health system, education, pension, gender equality, among many, many others. Therefore, uh, for us, in addition to the global health uh, environmental crisis, we have recently had to face uncertainty in all or almost all areas of our lives. So, and the question is how to design in times of uncertainty, how to rethink, build and design a future in this context. Uh, so, um, and for that reason, I would like to show you a quote of Janet Roydman. Um, she's an, anthrop an American anthropologist who defines the term crisis and it is very interesting for me. She said that Crisis is mobilized in narrative constructions to mark out or to designate, designate moments of truth. It is taken to be means to access historical truth and even a means to think history in itself. Such moments of truth are often defined as turning points in history. I think that this perspective uh, makes us to think that in moments of crisis, uncertainty can be transformed into an opportunity to revisit moments of certainty and build a material or, or immaterial future on them. So um, I think that this moment uh, of uncertainty, in my perspective, are sought in the temporality where identity, Latin American and Chilean, is absolutely intrinsic. Um, Camila, I will ask you later about how we can, um, let's say, uh, put on a practice the changing the uncertainty into an opportunity but uh, before reaching that point i i also want to ask carlos because again previously talking among us um you brought a very nice a very nice a very interesting concept for myself that was related to tension so i as you said before you recently actually last week you finish your master on contextual design. So mm -hmm. can you tell us more about how you discover this tension and how did it was uh, an input for your for your uh, design thesis? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I can start telling how I start my my journey in the Design Academy. And I remember the first day that I, we were presenting ourselves 
I was showing the song Latin America from Calle 13. I don't know if you're familiar with it, <laughs> which is basically like talking about all the struggles along the, the continent. And at the end of the, of the song, which was with the lyrics, of course, translated for the tutors, I put a picture of myself showing that I have a Spanish pass and a Chilean pass. So I am in between. I am in the tension. I am in the tension that our continent lives. And at that moment, I was quite naive. Uh, but like deepen and deepen and deepen into that and understanding that it was like really, really coming from my core. Um, yeah, the big explosion and the revolution in Chile start and that triggered like, um, yeah, that triggered all my research to like really understand what that duality that we live in our continent, like where it's really coming from. Um, and I think that like, I have been always in the confrontation, um, always in that tension. Uh, and what I understood in that tension, like also doing some field research in, in Chile, is that basically Latin America is the, oh, no, not Latin America, the continent and the big uh, mountain range that is along us, which is the Andes mountain range, is the manifestation or the materialization of two ongoing geological forces which are clashing, clashing, clashing all the time. We are feeling earthquake every single um, month. Um, and yeah, and we are part of that shake. So um, Latin America somehow, the Andes, is the place where there are many encounters. It's the place where the Spanish encountered the Inca Empire and all the, the ancestral uh, cultures. Um, it's a place where there are really wild lands, wild lands, but at the same time, a lot of deep extractivism. Uh, it's a place where you have a Catholic idiosyncrasy, but at the same time, a lot of paganism, but let's say native beliefs. Uh, so that's all the tension. And then like I started like also seeing like where those tensions were also within myself. Uh, so first I'm still I'm Spanish, but I am also gay. So being gay in Latin America, what does it mean? It's also an encounter. Um, and then I'm also come from a really, really wealthy family. So what does it mean to be wealthy in a, in a, in a territory where wealthy people, uh, it seems as something like that is like completely, completely against the stream. Um, and I would say, and that's the conclusion, I think, of all my research, and it's the emancipation of this tension. Um, yeah, that was found, I think, in Atacama uh, and in the Central Andes. And there are two really beautiful concepts uh, which refer to that. One of those is Tinku, which means meeting or encounter in Quechua, but they don't see the encounter as something negative. They see the confrontation um, as something that is positive. So both opposites are complementary. And then following that, and this is uh, a topic that Silvia Rivera Gusikanki um, have researched a lot. Um, there is an Aymara concept, which is called Cheje. And Cheje is a gray color um, and gray is a word of content in Spanish. So gray is the mestiza. It's like you are you are dirty, you are sad, you are dry. Um, but for them, gray is a word of power. Uh, and gray is not the blend. Gray is the acknowledgement of the white and the black. And both together, they have the power to emancipate and to develop energy. So. Um, Somehow, um, yeah, all this tension in our territory, in our society, in Chile, the earthquakes, in myself, uh, they should not be seen anymore as a fight, but as something that can develop power and energy to emancipate and to liberate ourselves from the dualism. Great. So I have a question for both of you. So previously, Kami, you were, you were talking about a how uncertainty could be have a turn into becoming opportunity. And Carlos, now you're mentioning how recognizing this tension could also let us to rethink how this great color, for example, should not be understood 
only as a, something dirty or not pure. So my question is how from design we can put on practice this, like very in a very pragmatical way. I, I will I will like to know more how through your researches um, you've been grabbing these these concepts and making them uh, as a design practice. Well, um, first of all, for me, the, the most important thing, and I, I think that that's a really beautiful thing from the Latin American approach, is to change the ontology and to change the ontology towards design, you need to change also the epistemology. So you really need a on the epistemology turn in order to get or to acknowledge other kind of knowledge. Uh, so that's something like really, really practical. So we don't need books anymore. We don't need museums. We don't need the, the hegemonic way of looking for knowledge to inherit in a different way. Um, and in that sense, like we can be silent, for instance, we can feel, uh, we can like be in between the forest. We don't need a book to understand the forest. We need to put our feet on top of the ground and feel the, the leaves uh, and touch them. That's the first thing. And I think that that was like a big turn for me to start understanding the territory, the people and everything in a completely different way, in a passive way. Uh, and um, to perceive more than to ask and come with the question. Um, a really practical example for that is when you approach with a camera, for instance. A camera has a really bad connotation. A lens is a phallus, right? Uh, but if you really understand what's going on with a camera, is that you are receiving the image. Uh, you are capturing an image, and the image is entering inside the camera. So it's way more feminine than masculine at the end. If you really understand that, like your way of taking pictures really change. Uh, and then you have like a completely different way to approach into that knowledge. That's a first start for me. Mm. Uh, yes, um, for me, it makes sense a lot of uh, the, the words of Carlos. And I think that the, um, the first thing is to understand what is the future. Um, and I think I, I, I would like I like so much the definition of another designer and researcher who defines the future. Um, uh, she's Ramia Massé, and she defines the future. Um, it is difficult to know what the future holds. The future is by means no empty. It will be occupied by built environments, infrastructures, infrastructures and things that we have designed. It will bear the consequences and and the consequences of, of our histories, structures, policies, and lifestyles, which we daily reproduce by habits or with intent in design. The future is already loaded with our fantasies, aspirations, and fears, persuasively designed visions and, and cultural imaginaries. I think that this quote is very interesting for me because also define how we can, how we can see the future and how we can design the future also. So, and for that reason, I think that in practice, we have to understand the future, uh, the future as situated, situated practice, which we build every day, day by day, in which um, and is already inherent in our actions and in our Latin America and Chilean history. And we cannot design away from our, our tradition, our history, and our own practices because the figure is drawn in our identity or gestures uh, and behaviors which in turn are inherent also in, in our past. Great, Kami, you know that uh, I'm super, let's say, I often, I don't like to use concepts such as a speculative or futures and yeah. so on because I don't know, in your opinion, and I also want to ask you about this, that I really believe that right now we don't have much more time to thinking about our future and we should start doing things right here, right now. So I'm yeah. curious about this quote and this concept that you're bringing. How, how do you put the future in today practice? I don't know, can, can you give me an example of how during your research related to um, biomateriales, have you done something related to? 
Uh, yes, so my latest research has been focused in studying different um, cultural practices uh, from ethnographic point of view, um, because I think that uh, you can you can design the future uh, with with uh, studying the different past and present. So. An example of this exploration was a research that I carried out with the creation of biomaterial, as you say, which is an experimental technique that attempts to reverse or maybe contribute to the consequence of, of the high consumption of non-biodegradable materials. Okay. So I made a um, I made a ethnographic research to analyze this process of experimentation. And this was using an ethnographic method uh, named Chain Operatoire. Chain Operatoire. Uh, so, Chain Operatoire. I don't know what is the pronunciation. Yeah, in French. <laughs> <laughs> and this method is it, very, very interesting because uh, this consists of observing different uh, technical processes, collecting mm -hmm. information, and analyzing it. On this occasion, Anne analyzed a friend while uh, while she was experimenting in the realization of a bio biomaterial named eggshell composite ceramic. Mm -hmm. And I was there for a long time or observing her uh, of each step, the use of tools, gestures, actions, timing, position of the tools on the table, uh, as well as an interview. So after making a diagram of the activity and analyzing their action in depth, it was very interesting to observe that the materials and tools used in the technical process have a clear parallel in the process of cooking and food. Okay. So in this specific ethnography, the technical process uh, is very similar to the process of preparation in food, so the previous process to cook. Um, he organized, for example, the table um, in advance in order to have the materials like closer to her, um, to optimize the time and, and, and maybe also to have a, a better result. Um, besides organizing uh, that she prepared every, sorry. No <laughs> um, the actor also recreates a, a scene very similar to a guitar hall. Um, it, it's very interesting because she prepares everything to feel comfortable and to feel certainty in the process that she is making, even though this process was absolutely experimental. So for me, it was very interesting to think that the, uh, at the moment uh, to perform the activity to the technical process, she sought certainty in a technical process that seemed to be familiar to her, which is cooking. And um, here is interesting to analyze that everything that is behind the technical process that the actor performs, maybe um, there is a familiar there is a familiar history, for example, because um, I, I can think who told her to cook or what culture does does she come from. So all of the technical process and the previous apprenticeship that uh, that she has is in the process of of making biomaterials. So that uh, led me to think about that each person has their own agency, their own identity, experience, learning, and knowledge of traditional techniques. And the creation and construction of a theater material will inherently carry the identity of the person, um, their integrated knowledge, and the culture that, to which they belong. Therefore, the result inherently carries the agency of the actor. So. Uh, this person, when designing a material, a future material, of course, has the, the identity of the person. Bello, bellissimo, super, super nice, Kami. Um, that made me really think about what Donna Haraway is saying about uh, it's super relevant to think from where our thoughts are coming, because it's everything intrinsically coming from our identity, from our what it's contaminating our actual present. So Carlos, in the, we still have some minutes and I really want to ask you more about uh, your last project related to your master degree, I believe. So can you tell us more about how you put on practice the tension you discovered and how you work with the uh, opposites and dualisms? Mm, yes, yes, yes. Um, 
I wrote a poem for like the introduction of my my presentation. I rem I, don't, I don't fully remember it, but it explains a <laughs> distinction and specifically that I'm mining. I position myself as a miner, but I'm not mining the copper. I'm mining illusions, fantasies. I'm mining the sun, the moon, the shines. So um, somehow the tension is my projects related to how I mine, but I mine back, how I mine back to the core, to what we really are. So the project basically, like totally pragmatically, um, it's uh, inflatable, it's a womb. You get it inside of a, of a round space, which is filled with seawater. Um, somehow I embodied the, the Andes mountain range, which is pushing up the Pacific Ocean above 4,000 meters and creating these salt lakes. I brought the, 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 the water from the North sea, Northern Sea, sorry. Um, and it crystallizes, and in the center, I create a machine um, that is able to harvest back the copper on the Eurocents. So I'm harvesting back all the thing, and I'm creating a crystal which is kind of like a coral, which is pure copper, but still alienated copper, which is the body of our mountain range of our country. But once I hear, I don't know where, in, up in the mountains probably, uh, that the tears of the Andes are those salty lakes. And those salty yeah. lakes have the power to heal. That cry has the power to heal those alienated body. So basically okay. what happens when you take out those cores, when you harvest those cores, those crystals, um, they get back to the mineral beauty when they're exposed to the salt. Um, and that's quite beautiful because the end result is no more than the mineral old body that you can find in the slope of the Atacama Desert. So um, basically the tension is in like, I am mining, I am reverting the process. I am using sometimes the same technique that they use to extract the copper, but I'm doing it all the way around. I am bringing them back to the natural thing. And the idea is like to leave those pieces, not in a museum, not in a podium, but back in those slopes. Wow. <laughs> Carlo, <laughs> I really want to see more about your project uh, because uh, besides how poetic it sounds, I believe that it has a lot of sense. Maybe because for us, for the three of us, like uh, Los Andes is something that is constantly present on our identity, on our way of orienting on, on our country. You know, if you have the, Ant Montes, uh, the Andes mountain range on your left, on your right side, that means that you're looking north and so on. Um, so, well, we are running out of time and I really want to thank you, Cami and Carlos. I'm super happy that we were together.